Welcome everybody back to uh, another episode of COVID and Climate Correlations. We've got Professor Steve Keen in studio with us today, and we've also got Scott Heffler back with us. So um, it's kind of the good old uh, crew again, and uh, I, I think we're going to have a lively conversation. I know we're going to talk about Boatfinger, uh, the blow up that happened with Steve uh, a, a couple of weeks ago, some accusations, mudslinging, all sorts of fun stuff. <laughs> we're going to be talking about that. Um, I'm curious about uh, the housing crisis, um, uh, Steve's solution for that. We might even touch on Minsky, uh, his, his, uh, his software. Um, but for now, let's, uh, let's, let's just check in with both uh, Steve and Scott and find out how they're doing. Scott, why don't we give you the first, how's Scott, uh, how's married life, and uh, is there anything new that you want to uh, just <laughs> throw out to the audience about what's, what's in the world of Scott Heffler today? Nothing new with me. I'm just interested in hearing what uh, Steve has to say. Yes. <laughs> okay. Aren't we all? Steve, okay, go ahead. What's uh, what's new beyond the... Uh, well, the... the whole lot of stuff. I mean, actually, probably the main thing to talk about straight away is what I'm doing with trying to get elected to the Australian Senate. Um, so that's that's what's been occupying me for the last uh, two weeks, apart from my, my gammy knee after having a knee operation, which has been... <laughs> Boy, uh, old age ain't fun when you when you when you when you your joints start to fail because of age rather than wear and tear from running. It's not so crash hot. But anyway, um, so you, have, um, you you know that I'm you guys know that I'm running for the Australian Senate on behalf of a, a new party called the New Liberals, and um, the party itself has, has arisen largely because just of just sheer disgust at the state of Australian politics which you could simply say sheer disgust at the state of UK politics. And when you had uh, 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 Donald in the, in the, in the uh, Oval Office, ditto for America. So there's something about the Anglo-Saxon world where we end up with absolute jerks being elected as prime, as, as prime minister or president. And the jerk in Australia is a guy called Scott Morrison. And he, he's he, it, it, the crazy thing, just to give a background to people who don't know the Australian situation all that well, Australia would probably, when, when you do the census and ask what religious group do you belong to, the largest, I think now the largest grouping in Australia is agnostic. Okay? So the majority of the population doesn't really give a stuff about God, you know. And if you, you know, I, I call myself an agnostic and an atheist when pressed. So the surveys are done, I think it's over 50% now are agnostic. Then the next largest group is Protestant. Then you get Catholic, that's rising actually because a lot of the Asian immigration is actually a Catholic in, in background. Then you get Buddhist and so on. Way, 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 way down the bottom, you get the sort of lunatics who run the scene in America, Pentecostals. Now, which religious group does our prime minister belong to? Have a guess. Pentecostals. You got it, mate. He's a penty looting costal. Um, and... Um, and uh, I'll come back to this cynical skeptic question later on. Um, so how on earth did a group which probably represents less than 1% of the population end up having not just the prime minister, but at least, I think it's at least four and possibly six of the ministry, and there's about 30, 30 people in the ministry. So you've got about one-sixth of the party, the leader himself, and, uh, and a substantial proportion of other part of the political scene coming from absolute tiny religious minorities in a predominantly agnostic to atheist country. And the answer is branch stacking because the political system over here has uh, each electorate, which, you know, the same sort of regional idea as the UK or America or any, any country in the world, you have a house of representatives. Um, each of those house of representatives has a branch of the party and the branch of the party would have maybe 25, like out of, there's 100,000 people per electorate. So of that 100,000, maybe 100, you know, 0.1% are politically active in either of the two major parties, Labor and Liberal here, which corresponds to Democrat and Republican in America or Labor and Tories in the UK. So you've got 100 people. Now, you might have a church, a Pentecostal church, and 1% of the population might belong to that church. That's a thousand people. So they can make a dedicated push to say, let's join the local party and take it over. And all they need is 101 people from the church to turn up and say, we're going to vote for the local member. That's 101 to 100. 
and, and, and you'll get a few who would you get a few who would go from the non-religious side, the, the standard you know, pop, for a fraction of the population, across to join the religious because the guy would be or woman. Normally, it's going to be a guy would be maybe charismatic or have a you know better appeal. So they that they might get ten percent of the vote from the normal members of the party and a hundred percent of the vote from the ones they've stacked it from. So you get hundred and ten to, to ninety in a vote of two hundred and you get a Pentecostal elected as your representative. Now that is the normal way. Our Prime Minister got in through the abnormal way and then he ran for pre-selection in a very uh, 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 for Australia a very ethnically white district which is not normal. Most of our states have got quite a mixture of, of different nationalities, particularly Asian Asian culture. Uh, so he ran and he was defeated by over 100 votes to six votes in this branch. And he managed to get the support of the Murdoch dominated press to post allegations about the guy who won, which ended up being a court case that the guy who was the allegations are made against sued successfully. Okay. Um, but but they had a, a, a recount and they, they I think it was either a recount or they just simply parachuted this guy in because he had also been the state director of the political party, the Liberal Party. Mm. So, you know, you, you get this awful mixture of both brute force politics plus religious factionalism politics. So I've got a bunch of Pentecostals running a running a, a, a non-religious country and the Pentecostals they belong to there's what they call this um, uh, prosperity gospel so the idea is that if you're a, if you're a good person and you love God and God loves you you're going to be wealthy and if you're a bad person and God doesn't love you and you don't love it or even worse you God doesn't exist you're going to do badly and it's your own bloody fault it's the religion of neoliberalism it's mm-hmm. turned neoliberalism into a religion that's what they've done and the, the, the classic so this this guy basically thinks not only is it the government shouldn't do anything which is the typical sort of neoliberal position you know minimize the role of government it's also saying that the government uh, you know if, if you end up being uh, needing welfare it's your fault why should we take care of you you know if you, if you were prayed harder uh, you'd be prosperous because god would reward you for being um religious this sort of absolute bloody nonsense anyway but the best example we saw of that, I'll, 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 I'll shut up and give you guys a good chance to comment in, in a second. But the, the best example was recently, he completely stuffed up the distribution of rapid antigen tests. And they, they said we didn't have enough in the country when the, when the um, Omicron outbreak exploded. Um, and there was no system for distributing them. In America, you know, that obviously rampant socialist nation, you get them for free. Okay. Garden is distributed, rat tests are free, or rats are free. In Australia, you've got to pay for them. Not only got to pay for them, you've got to find them. Which chemist has got them? Which retail outlet has got them? Has been prowess gouging. It's all been bloody awful. Anyway, a journalist in, in a conference, in a press conference, uh, said to him, some people can't afford to buy uh, rapid antigen tests. And his reply was, and I quote, some people can and some people can't. Now, how the hell do you process that? And the only way to make sense of it is go back to this prosperity gospel. If you're a good person and you love God and God loves you, you'll be wealthy and you can afford to pay for a rapid antigen test. And if you're not, don't believe in God and, you, and God doesn't love you because you don't believe in him, you're going to be poor and you can't afford the test. Yeah. So that's why I am running for the Senate because I've just it's bad enough having neoliberalism as, as, as a stupid uh, you know, economic policy. When it turns into a bloody religion and it runs a country which is secular, I'm in to kick them out. Yeah, I don't even, and I think Scott uh, has talked about this before that it's it's the masses or it's uh, the democratic majority that should realize what they're being hoodwinked into, um, and yet they they vote for this nonsense, and it's 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 mind boggling to me, and I don't know why. Um, I'm curious to throw this out to both of you, okay, because um, I'm noticing things uh, change very quickly in terms of me- in terms of mass media, at least from my perspective of where I am in North America. Mm-hmm. But the question has to do with libertarianism and the cult or philosophy of Ayn Rand. 
Now, the Pentecostals, as Steve has just pointed out, um, have something very similar in terms of their messaging. It comes from a little bit of a different foundation, but they seem to align very nicely. Do you guys see that about the, the libertarian, government stay out of things? It seems to fit and graph very nicely onto the Pentecostal description that, that, that Steve, you've, you've brought up. What do, you, what do you guys think about that? Uh, I, I think the brand view presupposes the uh, busy ant, lazy grasshopper mythology that if you're poor, it's your fault. And if you're rich, uh, you've been blessed. And in yep. the U.S., the Republicans infiltrated and then paid these preachers to talk about, especially in these Pentecostal, they call it full gospel and Bible Christianity in the, in the U.S. It's the Kenneth Copeland, Preflo Dollar, and uh, Kenneth Hagan was the one that started this. This is where uh, you send money to the church and God blesses you back. And if you're sick or have a problem, it's because you don't have sufficient faith. And this also has changed thinking about COVID because a lot of these COVID uh, anti-vax people are doing it because they, they think that it would hurt God's feelings if they got a vaccination because if you sufficiently had faith in God, then you wouldn't get sick in the first place. So I think it's just a great gift for the ruling class that there are people that will say, yes, it's my fault that I'm poor. And because it, it makes austerity uh, into something like a metaphysical norm. And then, of course, meanwhile, the, the ruling class treat each other like good socialist buddies, bail each other out, help, help each other out. But don't do that if you're poor. Yeah, well, that, that's a good point because... Like, I, I hadn't thought of that particular issue that the political party actually approaches the religious ones because they're now going to be aligned with them. And then it's a bit like you know, inviting a parasite into your body. Uh, it takes you over. And uh, and like the same thing, probably, I imagine, I, don't, I haven't researched it, but I imagine it happened here as well. The Liberal Party would have looked for membership in the local Pentecostal churches. And then and because they expect religious people to be more conservative than agnostics. And then what happens ultimately, you get this holy alliance between the religious and the political right. And yeah, they start with social issues with... here. They, they said, do you really want babies getting killed? Do you really want to fantasize about homosexual having sex? This should stop. So people thought, yes, anti-gay, anti-abortion, that sounds good. And then they moved into other stuff afterwards. Well, if, if you're like that, then you have to vote Republican, even though we're going to screw you health care wise and quality of life wise, it doesn't matter. Because think about all the gay people we're gonna punish and think about all the all the, the fetuses that, that will survive. So that was that was the issue. They were, they were more interested and I guess the US is like that. People get excited about about trivial social issues. Yeah. And and, and they'll sacrifice themselves in order to pull it off because God, God himself wants this. I mean what's what's more important than pleasing God? Because if you please God then Ten thousand dollar checks appear miraculously in the mail. You get a IRS sends you a check. I mean, this is this is what they preach. You'll get lucky breaks if you please Yahweh. Yeah, yeah. And um, I mean, it, crazily enough, the the left itself is responsible for some extent of switching from class politics to identity politics in this country about forty or fifty years ago. And I was involved in the in the writing of a document called the Accord. Not not heavily involved. I had only a minor role. But it was a like a attempt to bring about a, a sort of Swedish um, industrial uh, development perspective to the Australian uh, uh, manufacturing sector, and it got rapidly taken over by neo the neoclassicals and turned into wage restraint to cut back inflation at the time. Um, but what what you had at the same time was that a bunch of labor labor politicians, and I remember definitely Lindsay Tanner being caught up in this, saying we lost the last election because we stuffed up the economy. So what we have to do is to be wise about the economy. And that means grabbing a first year economic textbook, of course, is what he said, but this is the basic idea, grabbing a first year economic textbook and remaking the economy so it looks like the first year economic textbook, otherwise known as neoliberalism, neoclassical economics, and then marry that successful economics with um, promoting social policies, uh, you know, such as you know, he was, but he wasn't so much under gay rights, but, you know, supporting gays, um, uh, women's liberation, et cetera, et cetera. And my attitude was, I just, and I said it to Lindsay Tanner, I definitely remember this conversation, saying, look, your textbook thing will work for a while because you'll let the finance sector rip, but it ultimately it's going to stuff up because it's not at all an accurate description of how the economy works. And when it fails, you'll end up delegitimizing all the social policies you put forward. And that's what's pretty much happened. So as well as the right successfully 
using um, you know um, gender politics you know in, in the sense of let's go back to 19th century gender roles uh, in in their rise and anti-abortion blah 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 to some extent the left paved the way by going neoliberal Eesh. yeah I know that uh, from back in the old days when politically correct was just coined it was coined by Marxists making fun of the identity politics in the left mm. and now and now there's this fantasy of cultural Marxism which doesn't exist but now people associate Marx with nitpicking over you know uh, pronouns and all this other stuff yeah I know I know <laughs> it's laughable if you know Marx's own, own background and history but that's so you've got this terrible mess where the different political parties which should be fighting on prop well-founded economics and on class interests are fighting on badly founded belief systems and and in that battle um, the, the the right is far more organized and far better financed than the left so it ends up being a, a, a negative for the left for actually you know, clicking in identity politics in the first place so i have a question then what what class systems um would be uh worth fighting over in you know to just go back to what you said what what are the, oh, what are the... the yeah well maybe, maybe the labor party was obviously the part of the party of the, of the working class and trade unions and uh if you swallow a neoliberal uh, on neoclassical economics trade unions shouldn't exist hmm. so you've got a fundamental tension of your labor party and you're believing the textbook describes how um how the capitalist system works and that textbook tells you that labor markets distort the uh, labor markets are distorted by unions setting above wages above the marginal marginal product of labor uh, then you've got an inherent tension between the party you're supposedly re representing and the economic policies you think is going to make life better for them so you ended up having a, a weakening of the Labor Party, Labor movement within the Labor Party, and a, a move away from interest in wages and uh, and, and, you know, and the living standards of the working class uh, and the industrial system with which, in which the working class could labor uh, across to identity politics. And the belief was if we let the market rip, we'll get you know equilibrium in the market and that'll give you and, and, and faster growth and that'll work better. And we can deliver the social policies without all the heavy overhead of, you know, workers take, taking on capitalists, et cetera, et cetera. And it's all, you know, talk about, you know, you, you, a bit like you said earlier, Scott, about the working class being persuaded to, to vote for austerity um, in America, a similar sort of thing. Yep. And I, and I know the religious right in Australia is really hardcore. There's a documentary by Neville Drury where he goes around Australia and interviews the occultists, which are just, it's, it's basically, it's kind of a lefty pro-social religion, kind of abstract and vague. And then you have the, um, the, the Pentecostals and he interviewed three of them and, and they let him uh, videotape a, a live exorcism. And you, yeah. you really see there's a, I mean, it's more important to have a loving family of associates inside a persecuted group. Nothing creates, Nothing releases uh, dopamine more than being part of an excited religious group that believes in miracles. I mean, it's mm. especially if you're poor, because then you think, well, you know, I'm not going to get any relief from the government or from the way the society is run. But mm. God can always intervene. So uh, keeping hope alive is important enough that people will, will take every action that materially will lead to problems. But in the d religious dimension ought to help them. Yeah. Well, one thing I find um fascinating as well about religious groups like that like I I was a Catholic in my youth so I you know and I believed in God and all that I, my, my breakdown in that belief occurred uh, during the, the period when Australia was uh, being stupid and supporting America in the Vietnam War and then the more work I did on that the more I ended up finding that I um, you know rejected the, the religious stuff as well as the political stuff so I, I became an atheist in about when I was about about 19 I think but one thing when you are a religious person and you're in a religious meeting you can have a sense of ecstasy out of the group and you can see this euphoria that people experience all shared beliefs and all chanting and praying and bang and it's a completely euphoric experience and i can remember like going to catholic they never knew as exciting as pentecostals but that's a feeling you can't get anywhere else and when you become 
an agnostic. You don't have any comp. The only thing you can do is a mosh pit at a rock concert, you know. <laughs> And, so and there's the, something right about that experience. I mean, people ought to get together and have a sense of stuff oh, to belong. Right. Hang on. My niece, my niece is doing some blending over there, but I'll say that again. Sorry, Matt. Sorry. That's oh. okay, Lisa. It's your house. Spe <laughs> we have a special <laughs> guest. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, yes, Scott? I, I, we shouldn't underestimate the importance of of group belonging because yeah yeah it's extremely so atomized important. i mean intentionally atomized because then you, you won't have class consciousness and you, you won't have any sense of power so it's just constantly feeding us prozac video games entertainment and, and trivia and then divisive angry politics and the joy of watching cops kill people on tv it's just it's a it's a great distraction uh no oh, i lost my train of thought well, so the, 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 the catholics yeah. had an internal crisis because they were losing people to the excitement of the Pentecostal style of services, which is yeah. crying, hugging, experiential, the spirits in there speaking with tongues. And the Catholics were just going through this rote reading and people started leaving. So then the Catholics realized that they needed to bring in more of this direct experiential Christianity stuff. And that was a big deal. Uh, but isn't it strange that the Catholics would ever vote Republican, given their uh, Catholic worker newspaper that I used to... The Irish about. background, yeah, yeah, the Irish diaspora. And, and so liberation on. theology in, in South America. Yeah. So in, in the last election, 50% of Catholics uh, voted for uh, Trump, but like eight, over 80% of uh, evangelicals voted for him. So there's still yeah. some intelligent people in the Catholic Church. And actually, m most of the, the, the dry churches, they contain more atheists and more good social thinking, like Lutherans, Anglicans, yeah. Catholics. I mean, they're mostly atheists, but, but they realize that it's an important story to have in the background. It helps people uh, uh, maintain their morale. But these other, the, the wishful thinking, give money to Kenneth Copeland and God will have miracles happen for you. These, they're getting stronger and stronger. And I think a lot of it is because their services are more uh, exciting. And that's what, that's what people are going for when they go to church. They're looking for some miraculous, interesting social yeah, love and, experience. And like that sense, the sense of shared euphoria is, is an essential part of being human. Because it's what we, you know, we, we, you know, the, the interaction, we, we're very much a social species. And part of that feeling of, of being bonded with some sort of euphoric experience, and that can be everything like you're fighting in a war when you're keeping your buddies alive, and that's why military links are so strong. Or the relig religious experience, it's sharing this religious belief in you, summoning the spirits, and, and it's, a, it's a real hit of serotonin. And, and that's something that you get um, um, very much in the Pentecostals they and they, they're built around it. Whereas you look at the, you go back to the whole Catholic thing to the Protestants, there was a breakdown of that. Um, and I don't know the history of the, the any, anything like I should have the origin of the, the Protestant movement. Um, but you fundamentally had a breakdown of that euphoric behavior and institutionalized and got in the way of it. And they've got an, yeah, uh, the uh, Lion Candy said the hedonistic church morality bit with dopamine. And, and that's a very powerful thing. And, and once people have the experience and they only identify with the religious place, then it becomes God, God speaking to me. You know? And I mean, can, I'm, I'm going I'm to confess to a, a classic experience of dopamine in a moment. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you guys whether you've got anything in your own past like this. But I had a girlfriend who was, had, it was a narcissistic personality disorder type. And I'm, I'm so I've, in that sense, I've been in a, what became an abusive relationship, not physically, but emotionally abusive. And it took me quite a while to break out of it. But what I would find with her is that she would do something completely outrageous. And I'd say, that's it. It's over. Fuck off. You know, and then she would just bombard me with affection, absolute you know, wave of affection. And I could literally feel the, the chemicals in my brain. Suddenly the dopamine clicked in and I would forgive her what had gone on beforehand and go back into the relationship again. And it took about two years before I got to the point. I thought, this is just one sick human being and I'm getting the hell out of here. And completely, you know, I, I could just cynically regard the whole experience rather than being affected. But I could literally feel the dopamine rush hmm. when she pushed me from being angry to, you know, back in love again. Um, and I think that that dopamine thing is extremely important in why these people become so dedicated. Yeah, love bombing, the common method of love bombing. And, and, and that's what you get uh, in that group. And therefore, their sense of solidarity far exceeds the yeah. sense of solidarity you'd find people who are doing it for rational reasons, Labour Party arguments, even even people who do it for, um, for, for neoclassical um, 
uh, you know, belief in the, well, again, the same sort of thing that gives them a rush. Okay? And that rush is, is an important part of human, humans, their life experience. They want to get in a religious group or a strong ideological group. So bang, when they get inside a political party, they can take it over and they act in as common way, far more so than people who are doing whatever they're doing out of self-interest. Yep. I, I think the, the market has done a great job colonizing every area of what used to be spontaneous public social collectivity. So yep. the public, the, like the commons have been replaced by the shopping mall, which is like a forest. I mean, in America, people spend the whole day in the mall. They'll bring their running shoes. They'll jog around an artificial terrarium. And then all the walls of the space you're in are lined with stores. So there's places for exchange all around you, beckoning you to, to, to make exchanges. And, uh, Sports events, that's another place where people get to finally unite with a group and a group consciousness. And so, and of course, that's been, that's been capitalized. So uh, there's no places, I guess, except for religious groups. And then there's these new weird groups popping up, like the men's movement groups. Just any, any people are dying to belong to any type of, of experience. Fight yeah. Club begins that way. That he's so miserable, so he pretends that he has a some type of problem like alcohol addiction, just so we can go to these AA meetings, just so we can have some collective experience because people are just isolated. We're living alone. We, we work alone. And now we get all, all of our experience through the phone. So it's it, it may be the end of history because there'll be no more buffering of propaganda with good conversations and, and class consciousness and critical thinking because there's a direct line right from marketing and propaganda right to your brain through your phone. And you mm. see people in public will be staring at their phones while all around them in actual space are other human beings. And they're all looking into their phones. So it, it, it's, it's a dream come true for the mind control industry. Because yeah. there's, I mean, who, who are you going to get together with except academic groups and strange conversations like this? How are you going to maintain your, <laughs> your critical, skeptical, suspicious consciousness when you're being totally seduced by the most wonderful emotions and smiles and, and I mean, even commercials yeah. for like bladder bladder the, the, uh, medications on tv i mean there's a grandmother weeping with joy holding the sun the sun setting and this glare and then the cornfield is waving i mean you can't compete with that <laughs> yeah, though, what you can compete with when it when it when it runs into the real world and that's what's been happening because uh you know it, it, it's all very well to have these beliefs but if they're you know if there isn't actually a god directing everything up there then it all falls to a, a heap when you run into bushfires so where was our pentecostal leader when the bushfires hit, he took a holiday, a family holiday to Hawaii. Okay, and had to be dragged back to get involved in the in the in the, in the bushfire. That was his first major stuff up. Then along comes COVID, and he was pretty much going the herd immunity approach, which anybody who knows their epidemiology, uh, you know, knows that herd immunity has never worked. Okay, you don't. You only have got herd immunity when we have vaccines, which we didn't have. Then he stuffs up the vaccine rollout. Then he stuffed up testing. And you stuff up after stuff up after stuff up. Um, but and, and the attitude throughout is, again, this religious, oh, you know, it's your fault because you're poor type stuff. And what has happened is that's aggravated the um, non-religious majority of the population. So so many people saying, we just don't want to see any more of this guy, get rid of him. And, and that's now become the dominant sentiment. So it's looking very much like there will be a... Um, um, Oh, um, okay. Uh, I've got a uh, Greenland's asking for a 30 second, uh, too long, don't read on my latest book. So we'll, 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 we'll throw it in towards the end. But yeah, that's, there's now a revolt back against these guys because you can get away with this stuff when, when, when the rest of the world is behaving in what we call normal, you know, no crazy catatonic breakdowns of the social and environmental system. But we are having those catatonic breakdowns specifically because of the what they've turned into religion, the whole neoliberal uh, neoclassical idea we can have fine, infinite growth on a finite planet and uh, since there ain't an infinite god supplying the resources to make that possible it's it's falling over like crazy and now the peasants that includes me are starting to revolt which is why this peasant is running for the senate hmm. so I give it, do, I give, do i give a um too long don't like don't read, read for uh, uh the new economics as requested by green green I don't illness know. 
I yeah, I think so. I don't know what a too long don't read is. I've never seen well, that. That's before. a little one of the, one of many acronyms. You have to learn actually. The, the most important thing in the world these days, apart from believing in God, is to understand <laughs> acronyms. So, so TLDR stands for too long didn't read. Okay. Oh, I see. Okay, the book. So you <laughs> they want a summary of of the new economics on uh, behalf and, and, of and, and green Steve and here. green illness has noticed Scott as I have. You're sitting on a uh, on a ball, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> Oh yes, your chair is a ball. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's only way you can be bouncing like you're bouncing. You're sitting on a ball. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, I, I anyway, traded so my, like, uh, the too long don't read summary of the new economics is first of all neoclassical economics is nonsense. That's take for granted. You can build a decent economics by starting from macroeconomics uh, rather than micro. So you will from the bot top down, and you out of those definitions when you can't dispute a definition you derive a logical analysis of capitalism, which reproduces what's actually happened in the last 40 years. We have to bring energy into economics and the neoclassicals have left energy out and it's easy to do it. And once you do, you see what GDP really is, is energy turned into useful work. But to do that, you must create waste and therefore we have the great degradation of the bio or the biosphere caused by economic activity. And then finally, neoclassicals have completely hoodwinked themselves and us over it and got us into overshoot. So we, we're using far more of the Earth's resources than is sustainable. We have far less capacity to convert from uh, fossil fuels to re renewables uh, than, than is possible to say, sustain our current level of output. We're going to have to have a drastic fall in consumption. And the only way to make sure we come out the other side uh, with a civilization uh, worth worthy of the name uh, must as part of it involve ab abolishing neoclassical economics it's got to go that's i hope that's an okay tldr i think so hmm. i think so and i think that's hmm. the summary that you uh on the housing crisis let's be basically let's touch on that just slightly because i think that your solution to the ho housing crisis is a great reset and then also uh if i'm if i'm getting this correctly just as a summary uh, uh, a reset, um, and then also limiting the, um, the the valuation of the property so that the the rental ratio is in reach for renters versus yeah. owners, right? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll start with the second one first because that's ultimately the way you'd stop a housing bubble ever happening again. Because if you think about people competing to buy a house right now, uh, if you have two people who both want to buy the same property and they're both on the same income, then the person who's going to win the battle is the one who gets more debt from the bank, oh. more leverage. Okay. So we currently, we as individuals wishing to buy a property, we are encouraging, we, we want a higher level of leverage. And that's what sets off the process. So the idea with uh, the reform to say, we want to uh, limit the amount of, um, of money that can be borrowed to buy a property, to a multiple of the income earning potential of the property itself is to say that if you do that, no matter how wealthy you are, sorry, no matter how much, if, you, if, you, if you're somebody earning a million dollars a year or a hundred thousand dollars a year, if the place you're trying to buy earns $50,000 a year in rent, then all you can borrow is $500,000. So neither of you can get an advantage over the other out of borrowing money. The only way have an advantage is that you earn more income, and that's never going to be. I mean, you can't you can't get rid of that in a capitalist economy. Or if you earn the same income, the person who will win the battle is the one who saves more money and has a larger deposit. Hmm. So that's to break down the, the feedback effect that first of all causes the house price rises, but secondly makes us as individuals want a high level of leverage. Just would get rid of it by saying that there'd be if you see a house being advertised, it would say you know here's here's the asking price. Uh, maximum possible loan against this property, you know, five hundred thousand okay. dollars. So that's that's the part. Now the thing is, since we haven't done that, uh, what we have have uh, done is cause a massive bubble in house prices, far bigger than America's, but also a massive increase in household debt, again far bigger than America's. And that was a mistake. We shouldn't let the banks create that much money for it. It's fundamentally a Ponzi scheme. So we want to have what I'm calling a monetary reset. And the idea is to give 
everybody an identical amount of every citizen gets an identical amount of money it could be in america's case a hundred thousand dollars per person i'm not talking chicken feed here created in exactly the same way government normally creates money which is very effectively running a deficit the money goes to you uh per person per capita if you have debt the money is used to reduce your debt if you don't have debt you get the money and it can be in the form of bonds. So you would mm. not necessarily have cash you can spend into the real economy. Um, and that that's just using a government's capacity for money creation. And the whole idea is to, you've got a, a certain amount of money right now, which is, I'm going to get my hands right here, getting weird, weird feedback which hand is moving. This, this is money created by reserves, which is the government money creation. This is money created by loans, which is the private banking system. And I've got to get the right one to go up. Okay, <laughs> it's reversing on me. Um, what you want to do is push the credit money down and the reserves up. So you don't change the money supply, but you change what backs the money supply. And then when you did that, of course, banks would end up with far less income earning assets. They'd have, um, they'd have uh, reserves which don't earn income in the place of loans which do. So when you sell the bonds to the banks, that's what makes it worth the bank's while because mm -hmm. They, the reserves they've got are now used to buy the bonds. They buy the bonds, the bonds pay a positive interest rate, and they can also trade the bonds. And you can then say, well, we're going to effectively stop you guys from going bankrupt by giving you income earning bonds. So that there would be, you'd first of all, reduce household debt dramatically. Uh, you would reduce house prices as well at the same time, but because the debt fell and the house price fell, the equity of the owner, which is the gap between the valuation and the um, and the uh, level of debt you've got that remains constant but that's our it's not going to be easy to achieve that, but that's the objective and then if you do that in fact the debtor is better off because the debtor will have, take less time to repay the debt because the debt's fallen so even even though the gap remains the same it actually benefits somebody but you bring house prices down and existing homeowners benefit from that fall in the price okay I'm not talking landlords. Landlords aren't going to do so good. They're, no. they're a small part of the population. And I'm, I'm sorry, I don't care about landlords. Mm. Um, and I don't mind losing their vote. I'm happy to have them vote for the Liberal Party. Uh, but so the whole idea is to reduce house prices, maintain the equity of current homeowners, and then enable the, the renters now to buy into a market because the house price has fallen. And we may work out a way as well in which they can use the bonds as a deposit. Because for the last 40 years, all the policies have driven up the price of houses and benefited existing house homeowners. But it's excluded people, and particularly young people, uh, to getting into the market. The rental, the rents, uh, the, the, all they can afford is uh, to rent and the, they can't get a deposit together. So they've been driven into a life of renting. So we want yeah. to say, well, compensate for 40 years of discrimination against you. But you're the ones that are going to be net beneficiaries from this whole process. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. I have a couple questions oh. about that. There's a uh, Scott, did you have something? Yeah. Well, the, the argument against that, I would imagine would be something like that will cause massive inflation, but you're saying that there'll be no net increase in money printing because you'd be dampening the uh, bank loans. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. I mean, if, if you sold the bonds to the, uh, if, if renters got, got bonds in place of cash, then you'd actually have a fall in the money supply. Yeah. Mm. So it isn't, I mean, I've done all, all this modeling in Minsky, of course, only the preliminary modeling. I have to do more, more detailed uh, money, uh, uh, money, monetary modeling. And that just takes time for me to have, have time to build the model. But the basic idea is uh, you would, you're changing the valuation of assets. You're not trying to change the amount of money in circulation. A part of it, when you start paying interest on bonds, that creates money as well. So you have got some small money creation going on. But when I, mod when I model it, you get a boost in the economy because you're actually transferring money. Uh, you're reducing debt, which benefits those who have uh, large assets. Um, oh, interesting question from Ryan last year. Can you bring up Ryan's question there, Dan? Yeah, Ryan. Okay. Oh, OK. Yeah. Yeah, good question. <clears throat> uh, that is a good argument. And the idea would be to set this up um, if you, 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 I mean, we're not, we're not going to be able to do it in the next election because even if I get into the Senate, we'll still be a minority party. It'll be a Labor Party government and they will knock this idea as much as the Liberals will. 
So we're trying to put this forward as something which we can do if the party got into power, say, in 2025, which is the next election after after this one. Um, so it's not going to happen straight away. But the idea would be you've got to pass a, a law and the law can be overturned. Um, we would just try to get majority support for it. And um, again, it's not going to be easy. The banks will be totally against this, et cetera, et cetera. But I think what's going to happen is if we continue seeing ecological catastrophes at some point, then the whole thing about you know, being concerned about having high, high house prices is going to disappear. Um, but you're, you're dead right. The biggest challenge is the next administration can remove that constraint. Um, but what we have to do is as much as we can is educate people that what causes housing bubbles is too much bank debt. Hmm. And if we can, if we can just, if that's, that's the case I've got to make. And the thing is, I'm making a case where I'm blue in the face outside the parliamentary system and not being listened to inside. So the idea is my objective in getting to parliament is make this case inside the parliament where they have no choice to hear me, but to hear me, it'll turn up in, in the, you know, the court record, which is, which is called Hansard. Um, yeah, and, and but yeah, get away from the housing bubble. And the whole bloody globe's caught up in housing bubbles right now. I mean, we need to start you know, building resources to reduce the amount of reliance we have on fossil fuels and give us some chance of a transition to a sustainable economy on the other side of climate catastrophes. We're busily pushing up house prices. Okay, I, I have a couple of questions. First of all, in, earlier in the thread, they say, do not call it the Great Reset. So I'm going to throw a few questions your guys' way, okay? Don't call it mm -hmm. the, the Great Reset. I'm assuming this has something to do with some catastrophe. The words, the Great Reset. Yeah, okay. I think it's calling it a monetary reset, not the Great Reset, but a monetary reset. Okay. Um, yeah, and I'm, 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 I'm Green and Lost Machines enthusiastic with Silvio Gazelle's ideas, and so am I. I think that money should be something which depreciates if it's not used. Um, and there's, I mean, you've also got the ideas of um, of, uh, of, of SODI that I've still got to incorporate in my own work. So we, we have to think more carefully about the nature of money rather than, you know, ending up with a largely a large part of our problems arise from two things, an ignorance about energy and an ignorance about money. Hmm. And yet we have a society without which couldn't exist without energy or money. And that's our ignorance of both that has led to that led to our dilemmas. Okay, so I wanted to ask you about the bill that you are going to put forth uh, if you if you make it in as a senator. What yeah. does success look like? Um, uh, and, and you've already explained that the chances of the, of the bill being passed um, are slim to none because the Labour Party will upset it. It may come in in a subsequent election. But what my curiosity is is that um, other countries are going to be watching this. Um, if 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 the success of um, this bill eventually, if it does pass, what does success look like? And then how does that, how do other countries, how do other economic policies look at it and say, Australia did this, here's what the outcome was. Now this is, then the dominoes yeah. start to fall. What, what does success what, what, look like? What you'd have is a deflating a house price market mm -hmm. okay. without having a final economic catastrophe. So you could have like, a, let's say a 40% fall in house prices. And the economy just chugs along as nicely as it can in the context of global warming, uh, but it chugs along without change. Okay. Uh, the banks go from being the dominant uh, political and economic force in the country to subservient again, as they were back in the 50s and 60s. Uh, pe people might not know this particular line, but if you go back to the days when it's a beautiful life, you know, the, uh, that classic movie was the nature of banking. They were called a three six three business. Borrow at three percent, lend at six percent, and be on the golf course by three p.m. Okay. Like I want bankers to be back to that level because that's all they should do. They, you know, they they, they, they they try to run the economy. They come with what Marx himself called in a brilliant line: the roving cavaliers of credit. And he said, and this lot knows nothing about production system and should have nothing to do with it. But in fact, that's distorted our production system, which is why we're so unprepared for climate change. So get them back to being uh, ir irrelevant and let the industrial uh, uh, capitalists become the dominant capitalists in your society, not the financial capitalists. Uh, and then you also have economic growth coming out of it, again, with the question mark about climate change at the same time. Because if you do reduce the level of private debt, again, from my own modeling uh, and also from just looking at monetary dynamics, 
the economy would be boosted because the poor and the working class and the middle class would benefit more from this than the, the wealthy. And because they spend more quickly, the economy would be stimulated by it. So you'd get rather than having a fall in house prices causing an economic crash, you'd have a fall in house prices causing an economic boom. I, I, I have to bring up that uh, uh, that reference to Marx. I think it's 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 amazing. And you know what? There's something in uh, from the Google Oracle that's equity almost. OK, so if oh, yeah. uh, listeners type in the roving cavaliers of uh, of credit, this this quote from Marx that Steve is actually referring to, I believe it's chapter 33 of book three or something. Right. I think you're dead right, mate. I was actually just about to search, but that, that sounds... Yes, it is. The medium of circulation in the credit system. And uh, and I'll, let's have a record. This is, this is Marx at his absolute best. And he, he could be a turgid writer and he could be a bloody brilliant writer. And this was the absolutely brilliant stuff. Um, um, he's talking about... Wilson asks the arch user of Chapman whether he does not regard his high rate of interest as a sign of great prosperity and a high rate of profit. And then on it goes off, I'll leave out that bit, but he says, both forget that a high rate of interest can also indicate, as it did in 1857, that the country is undermined by the roving cavaliers of credit who can afford to pay a high interest because they pay it out of other people's pockets. Uh, and meanwhile, they live in a grand style on anticipated profits. Uh, so let's see, I've got a... Uh, and there's, it goes on further than that. But it's volume three, as anybody who's read a lot of Marx knows, uh, Marx's unfinished handwritten notes for subsequent extensions of the Capital One, which is the only book he edited and finished. So he's just as absolutely flying in some parts of the prose. Then it's it's beautiful. So chapter 33 of volume three is magnificent and people should well, read it. And, and I have to give Steve his credit here because if you Google search that term, Steve mm. comes up on that Google page. And what I'm saying yeah. is that this is an underappreciated uh, quote because Steve has quoted it and it is it's a beautiful quote and then I and mm. I think what you were saying is that that chapter really came to life right now yeah. there's there's other pros and I was trying to think how do you identify other pros like that other than just experiencing going through the book and and, and this type of thing and so I, I I mean what an anthology to take the 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 beautiful language the aphorisms the you know the you know those kinds of things out of Marx. Um, do you have any other ones? Not a, I mean off the top of your head. Look, I've, or... I've read, I, yeah, I have a, a lot of Marx. I mean, I read everything Marx wrote uh, on economics, so I, mean, I can't drag it all at the back of my head uh, instantaneously. Right. But like for example, he, his comment about where profit comes from. He says our friend Moneybags has to be so hat lucky as to find a commodity in the market whose value itself is a source of source of value. And that's where he says his use value is a source of exchange value, which is the analysis that I realized that Marx developed, but, un but destroyed himself by not by, by trying to hang on to the labor theory of value. So there's marvelous sections in, in Marx. And, but otherwise, I mean, there's one, one of the chapters in volume one of Capital, <clears throat> pardon me, is something like about 50 or 60 pages of him dissecting a government inquiry into poverty. And, and, the, and the fact conditions in factories. And it's important stuff, but it's as boring as batshit. So people would often get to that page and that's, that's that's all they read of Marx. So it'd be interesting to write an algorithm that's sort of got a colorful language index and you can see where the peaks were and you can just read the peaks. <laughs> well, this is, I mean, I, I, I really like that kind of thing, uh, uh, like language analysis. And I, so I was playing with the idea because it's uh, it's a power law. And, and if you look at the word usage, you look at the as the the most prominent used word in the English language, right? And of so, course, yeah. well, actually, it goes beyond the English language. It's actually in every language, ancient and modern. The preposition, yeah. Right. So, well, not it's not it's just the uh, yeah. and well in English language, and then the next most useful language is half as much, and then half as much, and half as much, and half as much. So, mm. it's a power I think, law. It's yeah, a power law. So, law. Yeah. Yeah. The Ziff law. And so what the, what I was thinking of trying to run is something that would pull out like roving and cavaliers that they're not used yeah, anywhere. That's, that's right? so, unusual word combinations. Uh, but just a couple yeah. of quick comments. Ty, Tyrone Keynes has said, thank me for the Minsky software. Uh, Tyrone, I'm actually writing a report to Friends Provident right now. So I'd really appreciate you dropping me a line. Um, I was joking, debunking at gmail.com is my email address. So 
just pop me an email because I want to give some examples of people making use of the software now. That'd be great. And Alex is saying about people won't stand for having the values of the house are deflated. You're dead right. They probably won't. Even we explain how we're going to try to do it. But there's over 30 percent of the population that renters now, and they can't buy into the market. And I'm going to basically ignore the ones who own in their attitudes. I want the renters to be voting for me because that'll get me a quota, and then I can go and have some chance of pushing the policy through. Okay. Um, I, yeah, I want to talk about that just a little bit more. Hopefully, that was okay to put that on there, just so that yeah, you know the, the the readers got that. Um, mm. So, the the people that actually own the houses, a lot of times they're the uh, the biggie boomers. They're the people that have worked an entire lifetime to get you know that that uh, you know ten times <clears throat> fold um, valuation on their property. These are their retirements. These are you know, and I think, I think, and I describe this as something like uh, not in my backyard syndrome. So they love the idea. They love the idea of social housing. They, they, um, uh, for something like this to happen, it is a real up the, upset the apple cart, wouldn't, wouldn't you say, to bring it back to a, a religious term? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's a problem because, they, I mean, you go to a dinner party these days and all the conversation, thanks Tyrone, all the conversation is about bloody house prices, you know. I mean, that's really stimulating. There's no philosophy anymore. <laughs> there's no, you know, political discourse. There's no discussion of engineering and science advances. It's all how much of your house prices are. It's brainless. And I wish mm -hmm. people would appreciate that. It's, you know, it, that, that is not the way to build a sophisticated society. And we've been seduced into it. And the ultimate beneficiaries of it are just the financial sector. Because what's happening now, and I saw a couple of articles about this that I'm going to be referencing in my keenforthesenate.com, my webpage, I would have mentioned that, um, uh, is that the finance sector is now saying, well, why don't you use your superannuation, your pension, to pay for the house price? And the only real beneficiaries in the long run are people who own a lot of houses, so landlords, real estate agents, and banks. They're the beneficiaries and sometimes media for the advertisements. The rest of the society gets screwed by it. I would, I would also add that the municipalities are never going to fight it because that means higher property valuations, which means more government revenues. Um, yeah, that's right. It, it, sales right? tax is a major source of revenue for state governments, which can't create money. So they end up wanting a property bubble as well. But it's all sorts of ways in which we're seduced into, into wanting the financial parasites to take over the system. The people Mark so beautifully called the roving cavaliers of credit. That's right. And here, everybody, is um, Steve's new address on... It, it, it might not be triple W, mate. I'm not sure, but it's certainly keen for the Senate.com. Given uh, Probably both, I imagine. Uh, yeah, no, that's that's it. I'm looking at it right now. And uh, here, just for everybody to uh, look at, uh, that's what we got. Uh, you know, there we go. That's it. Yep. There, there he is. It's not it's far from finished, but it started. That's the main thing. That's the main thing, isn't it? Okay. Mm. Um, so, uh, Steve, normally when housing, so right now the housing prices are supposed to be high because of the urban flight and lack of labor. Uh, but normally when housing prices jump up, what's the cause? Fundamentally, an increase in the rate of change of new mortgages. That's what it is. Okay. So uh, when you buy a house, you've got to be borrowing money to do it. So the, the demand is change in mortgage debt. Okay? And then that's what sustained the current level of house prices. So what actually gives you rising house prices is increase in the change in mortgage debt. And it's an acceleration effect. And when I, when I do the um, uh, mathematics on America, which has got a vastly different pattern of both household debt and house prices to Australia, I get exact, almost exactly the same correlation coefficient. And a, a colleague of mine, I've got a paper, I've got to finish with them, but I've just never got time to finish, um, uh, shows that the, 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 the causality, even working with a linear analysis of causality, goes from mortgage debt to house prices, not the reverse. So there's, there's feedback both ways, obviously. If house prices are rising, people are willing, willing to borrow more money and want to borrow more money. And if you've got a rising amount of borrowing, that'll cause rising house prices. So there's a, a dual causation. But overwhelmingly, it's from changing mortgage debt causing house prices. All right, Steve, I have a question. One final question. We're at the top of the hour. Um, I'm yeah. really curious about the um, 
uh, the municipalities, right? We, we just kind of talked yeah. about this and the municipalities, uh, it does make sense for their budgets, uh, increase house prices actually makes sense for their, their, you know, their municipalities because of the property valuations. Okay. So if the property valuations went down, okay, in theory, just to get the conversation going, mm. um, this, this could mean that all of the, um, uh, the people who own the homeowners would be paying less taxes. Okay. Is there mm. a mechanism that could shore up that could buttress that could say municipality corporations, you can have this kind of like um, shored up fund or, or something maybe created from MMT. I don't know, but I'm trying to kind yeah. of fill and plug the holes here a little bit. Oh, cynical skeptic asked the first question, received no reply up till now. So hang on a sec. Can you repeat it? There's been point, he's got a point. He did ask the first question. Okay, here we go. We'll put it on the screen. Okay. Okay. I haven't done the sterilization research. Um, I think you look at the work of, um, I, I think uh, Josh Ryan Collins in the UK may have done some work on this. Um, you need to do a double entry bookkeeping approach to it. So, um, and I, I, my expectation would, if you see that sterilization going on, it really doesn't have much impact because the central bank buying buying bonds back to try to change the impact of a, uh, of a government deficit. The only way it has impact are they buy bonds off the non-bank public. Now, that fundamentally ends up being buying bonds off the financial sector because non-bank financial institutions are the main buyers of bonds. So I would think what it, what it might actually do is reduce the amount of money that goes into stock market speculation, which would be a damn good thing. But in terms of impact on the physical economy, I don't think it would be that as much. It's something you could explore by playing with Minsky. So what I'd recommend is downloading Minsky, looking at the double entry bookkeeping involved and seeing what the effect is and separate out the household sector and the firm sector from the non-bank financial institutions as depositors in the banking sector. Okay, that help. And on your quote, Danny dead right, it's a major issue. So you'd have to do something to, to make local councils and, and uh, state governments uh, benefit even if house prices are falling and there are less transactions going on. And one possibility is if you have something which means being a landlord is no longer a desirable business for a lot of people, because the landlords in Australia lose money. They're losing money and try to gain on improvement on capital gain. So if you say we're well, going to lose money and not get a capital gain, you're going to see a lot of people selling their rental properties. That ironically will mean an increase in sales tax revenue from a huge boost in the number of house price sales. So for a short while, it'd be a positive impact in the opposite direction. But in the long term, you'd find us have to find something else that'd be the main revenue source for local governments. Hmm, good point. Actually, isn't isn't more home ownership a, a better net benefit for municipalities because they're yep. right more people that's owning a, houses? Yeah, and like that's if you just give me share the screen from a matter was actually bring up the housing policy because it starts with a really uh, impressive graph, uh, impressive in that it, it it let me lead off and saying what the policy should be. So I'll just actually at a single page view and make it larger. So when I bring it up, you'll see what I'm talking about. So give me a screen share here. Yep, go ahead. Okay. Okay. Now let's go away from here. Hang on. So that's, this is housing tenure in Australia. This is the percentage of people who own their own house outright. It's gone from 43% back in 1989, down to under 32% in 2018. It'd be lower still now. Those have got a mortgage from 30% to 37%, probably, again, to be up probably over 30, probably up to 40% now. Those who rent has gone from 18% to 28%. And those who rent from the state has gone down from 6% to 3%. So it's been an appallingly bad, that the whole idea of government policy was to increase home ownership. What has it done? It's reduced home ownership. So I was saying we've, we've got to change direction. Right on, okay. Um, any other final ones that you want to jump on or is that, uh, I think we can do a better job just for anybody paying attention. I think we can do a better job with uh, Steve's done his best, but I think maybe we should, uh, I'm agreeing it. with the cynical skeptics asked about the trade balance. And I agree with you, which is the opposite of what uh, MMT argued that one, one error say MMT has got its knickers in a twist. So I think you're correct there. Right on. Okay. Okay. 
All right, Steve, thank you okay. for this uh, time. Scott, thank you. And for everybody, we'll see you next week. Thanks. It was good fun. Okay, bye. Yeah, bye now.